Hi, everyone. Thank you for being here. It's such a pleasure to be with you. And it's a pleasure to um, be here, especially with you, because I am going to be teaching next semester, which is really exciting. Is everybody comfortable with me not wearing a mask? OK. OK, sure. Let me just make sure that everybody can hear me. Can you hear me if I do this? Yeah? yeah. OK, wonderful. OK, so sorry. So I'm one of these techno I'm a technologist, but I'm always technology challenged. So I, I empathize with people who are trying to use technology for transformation. As Elspeth said, I am the founder of Center for Transformational Change. And what we're going to be talking about today is how you use storytelling and narrative for social transformation and why. Okay. In March of 2013, a woman named Boreen Rahman, who was working with an organization called the Orangi Pilot Project, um, just outside of Karachi, was assassinated. She had been an effective community leader who's working with local, uh, the local communities, informal communities on water access and on land rights in this informal settlement. And her work was so effective that she became a threat. She was not the founder. She was not out there, but she was so effective within community that she became a threat to the people who were in power. They still don't know who actually killed her, but we think it's sort of a combination of the mafia and the police. The problem that came to me was that she had never actually documented her process, her process of engaging with community. She was extremely well regarded, well liked. She was welcomed into the community, even though she wasn't necessarily of the informal community. And the Orangui Pilot Project had been um, had been funded in part by the Rockefeller Foundation in New York and in Asia. And when she was assassinated, it sent sort of shockwaves through the foundation and through the communities in, in South Asia. And, sorry. and so the Rockefeller Foundation, a woman named Nancy McPherson, who was run at that point, the director of monitoring evaluation of the entire foundation, came to me and said, how can we make sure that people who are doing these, this work in community or working with communities, that their, that their process is documented for future generations so that we don't lose the wisdom, so that we understand how people are doing this work truly with people and how do we push that forward? How do we actually clarify that? And so with that challenge, we started working out what it is that we really needed to understand. What do we need to understand about the way people work in communities and how they are transforming their situations by themselves or in coalition? And so the design question that came to me was, what kind of leadership, what kind of leadership process does it take to catalyze transformation at scale? And we'll talk about scale in a second because I'm allergic to that word, as been, has been noted. But how do you do it at scale to ensure just futures for everyone, not just for a certain class of people, a certain category of people, a certain set of people in academia or in government or whatever, actually for everyone? And how do you use optimism or hope, enterprise, innovation and storytelling to do it. So that was this design question that came to me in about 2015. I spent the next three years trying to figure out this question. I worked with the Institute of Development Studies in Sussex and a number of organizations all around the world to start thinking about this. And we came up with a list of like 400 organizations, individuals from about, from, oh, sorry from about 50 years before, from the start of sort of the aid and development, like the modern aid and development constructs or post-World War II, till now, to make sure that we weren't losing lessons from the past and that we were bringing them into the future, but that we were having a future and innovation lens on it. And so what I came up with was transformational change leadership. 
it's a framework that was developed with the Rockefeller Foundation with their support. And it's based in storytelling, meaning we look at how people are transforming in communities by listening to their stories, by analyzing them, and then by putting them into a certain process that, that explains how transformation happens. And we came up with this construct. So the construct of what makes change, what makes transformation happen. And it's these seven characters which I'll tell you about in a second. But their vision, empathy, perseverance, community, risk, collaboration, and mobilization. And the way we came up with this framework was by listening to the stories of these 400 organizations through time, through uh, direct dialogue um, as well. And we derived patterns off of what we learned and what we heard. And it was these seven characteristics that kept showing up over and over again. And it didn't matter whether someone was an organizer, sort of an, uh, sort of an organizer in the 1980s against, you know, people against AIDS stigma and HIV stigma, like ACT UP, which we'll talk about in a second, or someone creating sort of a social enterprise. These were the seven characters that just kept showing up over and over again, because there are many ways of making transformation and there are many things beyond this that you need, but these seven things just kept popping up. And so we derived, we created this framework and this is what it is. And then what we did was when you go to the frame, the framework is uh, available at tcleadership.org. It is Creative Commons licensed. Anybody can use it. The only thing you can't use is the photographs, but you can use anything else. Um, the way we told the story of this framework was to go back to the stories that we had used to derive this and we told the stories, we told the stories of the characteristics. Okay. So we chose initially to launch the framework with um, four organizations per characteristic. So there's seven characteristics. So we told the story out of the 400, we chose 28 that were sort of representative of the whole thing. Now we, so, we have four organizations. Like I said, this one is called the Center for Sci Science and Environment in New Delhi. Um, they represent vision, right? So there's, there's a particular, uh, and what I'll tell you is that this is, we're gonna be doing this, um, we're gonna be running through this entire framework during the course, Catalyzing Transformation next semester. So who, do you know who's gonna be in that course? Half these people. Half these people? Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so I'm trying to decide because I, I don't want to be repetitive next semester. Um, so the way we came up with the people who we were going to slot into each single characteristic, right, was that we defined what we meant by vision. In the case of vision, it's a, we have long definitions that we've written that you can go to um, when you go to the go to the site. Every single organization that we picked of the 28 represents all seven characteristics, but they, but they tell the story better of sort of any given characteristic like vision. And vision means, you can probably understand what vision means. The, the, the framework is meant to be very comprehensible, very accessible and without a lot of explanation. But the thing about vision is that it is about carving a narrow path through complexity to understand where you're trying to get to. And it is not based on product. It's not based on what you put out into the world. It's based on an understanding of how you need to navigate different systems. Because in order to change the system, you need to understand where you're getting to. And so the Center for Science and Environment, for example, in New Delhi, carved a whole new way of doing journalism for the environment because there was a, there was a gap. There's a gap in the market. And Delhi is one of the most polluted places in the world, as you know. They just released, um, this, this was, they, they formed in the early 2000s, but the problem persists. Um, but what they've done is they've changed the way they actually report on and engage communities to, to create this, uh, to sort of create this connection between science journalism and media, right? So vision means that you see a market gap, 
or that you see a possibility and you navigate towards that, you're not always gonna get there. That's the thing about social transformation. You may never get there yourself, but you're pushing towards progress and you can see it. That's vision. The second characteristic is empathy. Um, and it's not that Silicon Valley kind of empathy that I'm talking about, right? It's not like you put on a pair of goggles and like all of a sudden you can see what other people are seeing. It is about lived experience. It's about immersion, right? So you don't have to be from a community in order to have empathy, but you need to know the community very, very well. You need to be in community with them, right? So this photograph is of someone named Violet, she would say, who is a community health worker who understands who has been in community with her patients for decades and understands and has created a network, a coalition of community health workers as well. And so meets a number of the other criteria, but what she brings is an understanding of what they're going through in order to get better health outcomes. Third is perseverance. And this means adaptation, it means innovation, it means being in the game. It means like always being present. It means not giving up. Um, and it means understanding that this is the long game, right? That transformation happens over time. It doesn't happen because of particular solutions. It means that you're there. The example that I have here is the coalition of Immokalee workers, which is a coalition in, that started in Florida of migrant workers who used their collective bargaining um, and collective action power to, to increase wages for um, farm workers, for migrant farm workers. And they've just persevered over time and they keep adapting their model. Community. When, you, when we talk about design or design thinking, when we talk about these, we talk about being community-centered or human-centered quite a lot. It's essential transformation. You have to know how to be in community, to harness community power, to understand, to always be um, thinking about what the community needs, right? So it's slightly different than human-centered design, which sort of puts an individual at the, big, at the center. This is about putting a community at the center of any kind of product design, any kind of systems design, any kind of organization design. It's putting that community at the center. The example, I've, the photograph I have here is of an organization called the Melissa Network, which is out of Athens. And what they've done is they're a group of women refugees who came to Greece many years ago and started a center for other incoming refugees. And they work on anything from like childcare to community integration to media literacy, but they've created a center that is women refugees helping other women refugees. Next characteristic is risk. And the way to tell the story about risk, first of all, is to understand what risk means to transformation. It is not just taking risk, it's also assessing risk and mitigating it. Like how do you really understand where you need to go? How do you understand what you need to sacrifice or what you need to give up or what you need to take on, right? That may or may not get you that outcome. Unfortunately, often in, in the work that I do um, with human rights defenders or community leaders, or even aid and development workers where that's getting more and more risky. Risk means physical risk, but it doesn't mean just that, right? So when I was putting together this framework and starting to read these stories, everyone that I kept slotting into risk was at physical risk. And a number of people that uh, we highlighted, unfortunately actually were either threatened or assassinated. You don't, you don't have to do that kind of work to be transformational, right? There are different kinds of risks. There's reputational risk, there's financial risk, there's organizational risk, but it's about really understanding that you need to push the envelope. You need to push the frame forward in order to transform anything. The, um, the image here is, is of a man named um, Edmund Sakani, who is from SIPO in, in uh, Sudan. And what he's done is he just tries to get people to vote, to get registered to vote, 
right? And, and for that, he's often under death threat. The next characteristic, the second to last, is collaboration. And the story we told for collaboration is an organization called Walker Pony Mobile. Now collaboration means not just coming together for projects, it's coming together to build coalitions or to build community, right? So there's a couple of different aspects to it. Um, Wapikoni Mobile is an organization in Canada that engages First Nations youth um, who are often at that point at risk for falling out of educational institutions, for suicide, for just, you know, sort of falling off the grid. And they, they engage them, they teach them media skills, and then they help them together co-create stories. Right. And through that, they've been to like Sundance, they've been to all these different places to Cannes, I think, and they create stories about their own communities. And it's collaborative because they're bringing together, they're actually creating collaborative mechanisms, they're co-creating story, um, and they're also creating a coalition across the country. And the last character, the last characteristic is mobilization. This is the one that in the aid and development sphere is the one that often is most rejected. People don't wanna think that they're mobilizing people towards something. This works better, you know, when I talk to people in the human rights field, um, but they're like, yeah, yeah, we're mobilizing people, but everyone is mobilizing somebody to something. Everyone is asking someone to join something or to think about something differently. Um, in the case of this character, so the story that I've highlighted here is of the organization ACT UP, which is uh, a coalition that came together in the 1980s at the height of the AIDS crisis when there was stigma, there was discrimination, there was lack of support. Um, there were, and people were just were dying because of lack of support. And the ACT UP coalition came together and, and, and used every single communications, policy advocacy, community engagement tool at, they created new forms of engagement. It was absolutely brilliant. And so they mobilized people and changed the way policy happened in this, well, around the world really. And so there are many different forms of mobilization, anywhere from developing products and getting people to use them to PR, not PR, to storytelling, to advocacy. There are just many different forms of that. And we're all always engaged in it. This is the last, sort of like the last characters that we saw that everybody doing this, no matter where they are, where they sit, the way they're making change, everyone is doing this, right? So all these seven characteristics, anybody who's engaged in trying to transform systems or transform policy or transform their neighborhood even, right, is they're doing all these seven things. And it's not linear. It's not like, okay, I will establish vision and then I will like have empathy. It's like, it's all, it's all fluid, but this is kind of the way we, we set up our story, right? It's the story of transformation and this is how it happens. Now, some of the things that are, you know, sort of challenging about this is that a lot of these um, examples are about impact at scale, like people affecting thousands to millions of people. Transformation doesn't have to happen like that. So when I say, when we look at the framework, when we talk about this, when we talk about this during the class, I will be challenging the notion of what scale means every single time, because you can transform. Often the most significant transformation can happen one-on-one. -on -one. And that's something that organizers know, right? People who come in with an organizing frame or community engagement frame know that transformation happens in conversation. It happens when you know each other, right? So you can, you can do like a 10,000 person march and that's transformative. You can do something like ACT UP, which was multi-year, multi-generational, multi-ethnic, multi-strategy, multi-platform, and that's transformative. And sometimes one of those stories that I didn't tell here, there's a story of a, of a man in, um, in a neighborhood in Port-au-Prince who has literally engaged youth who are at risk of like, again, falling out of educational systems and, and such, has engaged them to sort of transform the physical environment of their neighborhood. And that's transformed the way they relate to each other and to the you know, sort of community at large. 
literally, it's just one neighborhood and it's been transformative. So the way to think about transformation isn't about big. We often think, we think about systems change. When we think about transformation, we think about these things are like, there's a natural inclination to think big. It's not big, it can be deep, right? And that's why when I talk about scale, I'm not talking about millions of people all the time. Sometimes I'm talking about, you know, either one location and it's deep and embedded, or it's like, you know, we start rippling outwards, but it's, you can start small. So in the, um, in the framework, we've talked about these characteristics, right? We've also, and I'll, uh, I'm not gonna go through this too much because I really, what I really wanna do is have a conversation with you. Um, we've also sort of talked about movements, where you see these happen. So it's not just movements as in social movements, but it really is I'm trying to build, bring a social movement frame to aid in development and to you know, social innovation and to design and really to kind of understand an organizing community engagement kind of movement frame. How do you bring this in? So that's why they're called movements, but they're also sort of issue areas. Like where do we find transformation happening? It's happening anywhere from like in climate justice to gender rights and gender justice to, um, to currency, right? Where is transformation happening? So we have to kind of see where, where it's happening, but also where it's possible and how we bring this frame to it. The second thing is that for transformational change leaders, for people who are leaders or are following this process, they need a certain number of tools. Right? They're gonna need things that are innovative, like anywhere from storytelling to um, new forms of banking, right? anywhere from social media help. I'll tell you what, the one thing that I find consistently is that people are flummoxed by, <laughs> by social media and storytelling and media. Often like people who are doing this work, they don't get supported for it. They don't get taught it. They don't get funding for it. Um, but so innovations, that section is all about the tools that people need and that we need to develop in order to, in, in order to create, uh, sort of help the, the, um, the job of transformation. And then at the end of the framework, we have a discussion activity guide, which we will go through during the class as well. Um, and this is really, this is a self, this is for self-study. This is for people who are anyone who wants to engage in transformation, who wants to understand it, who wants to support it, like philanthropists or such. This is to help you navigate the framework and it helps us understand where we are in our own processes. Like we're trying to catalyze transformation. Where are, like, where are we? How do we understand where we are in terms of vision building? How do we access our own risk tolerance? How do we sort of think about these things? And so there's a guide that we developed that anybody can use. You can use it and anybody can use it. We'll be using it during the course. If everyone wants to sit in, anybody you know, who's not in the class, you're welcome to, um, or do it yourself. Um, and so, why is this all important now? Like, why is it important to tell these stories? Some of them are from 50 years ago. Like I have, I have one person that I tell the story of who mobilized literally in the 50s and 60s. Why is this important to know? Because we, we keep making the same mistakes over and over again, right? And progress, progress doesn't mean that we forget the past. It doesn't mean that we only concentrate on the future, but it means that we have to have a future lens. And when I look at what we're going through right now, all the different things that we are working on, whether we're in human rights advocacy, whether we're in design, whether we're in you know, entertainment, wherever we are, we're dealing with an intersecting set of problems from climate to displacement, to inequality, to growing authoritarianism around the world, all these different things, they are intersecting. And we have to be able, especially as designers, we have to be able to tell the story and inspire imagination around what is possible. How do we get out of this cycle? How do we make life better for ourselves and for other people in the future? How do we have a future at this point? Like this is what I'm, this is what I'm occupied with now. When I look at what's happening with climate and when I look at happening with, what's happening with authoritarian governments, like how do we have a future? And what's our role, wherever you sit, Right, I have multiple hats, but wherever you sit, how do we have a role in creating this imagination? How do we create hope? How do we manufacture processes 
and new forms of being with each other so that we don't make the same mistakes of the past and so that we can actually like literally breathe in 10 years or literally vote or get healthcare or express ourselves, right? Like, how do we do this? Um, and so this is why I've just said the way I'm meeting this challenge is that I've started a new, basically a new social enterprise. So I, in 2018, at uh, the 10 year mark of my last company, I sort of took a look at it and I loved it. It was beautiful, it's called CL. It was this sort of innovation studio here, working internationally on human rights and, and narrative and aid and development. But it was an innovation studio in New York. And it was like at the height of like, you know, sort of the descent into fascism around the world. And so I decided to shut it down. And um, it took me three years to shut it down. And it took me, you know, three years to plan this next company, Center for Transformational Change. And we just lost, launched this autumn. But the theory here, we're going to be taking the framework that I developed and socializing it, basically. Right. So we have three theories of change. The first one is in order to transform, we need to cultivate community power, right? We need to cultivate their existing communities. People are doing this work already. We don't need to sort of build new communities. They're there and they're, they're, they're doing the work and they're doing the work with effect and impact and often we're not listening to them. So how do you cultivate that power? The second one is to that is that leadership exists everywhere if you know where to look. We need to make sure that we are always, when we're looking at the people who are truly making change, is that we're looking at the right people or the right processes. Like often, especially in sort of the aid and development world, um, there's a lot of sort of Western headquarters that get the funding, right? And the people who are actually making the change are in communities in lower resource regions of the world. Um, North America, South America, wherever it is, but they're the ones really doing the work and they're doing the work in an intersectional, multi-generational, multi-platform way. There's leadership everywhere and there's no dearth of it. Like I know that, there's, there, you know, I've heard quite a lot of people saying, well, you know, where's leadership? Who are, who are the leaders? Where are leaders? You know, because there has been, there has been um, a little bit of a collapse in terms of politics, I guess, um, but it's everywhere, right? If you know where to look. And the third sort of theory is that, you know, we need to create a narrative infrastructure for social, social transformation. That we often talk, especially in the sort of technology worlds or design worlds, we're talking, we talk a lot about data. We talk a lot about, we're talking a lot about AI and sort of like technology-based solutions. What are the stories? Like I can't make, social change just on an Excel spreadsheet. I can't do that just on a ledger, right? What are the true stories? Like, what are we, what, what do we need to amplify? What do we need to listen to? Who's making the change that we you know that needs to be followed and how do we understand it? Like, how do we digest it? Narrative is a form of data, but it's a form of data that has, you know, contours. It has human need, it has human, it has pain, it has possibility, it has all those things attached to it. And so how do we, how do we harness cultural expression and how do we create infrastructure around the world for solidarity using story? So those are the, those are the three sort of theories that the center is gonna be working from. Um, this is where you can find us if you want to. You're gonna be finding me starting in January right here. Um, but that's sort of, that's what I've been thinking about in terms of using storytelling, right? To, to catalyze change and to amplify the people who are doing the actual work of change. 